Howdy folks, welcome to Found Flicks. On today's Inning Explained, we'll be looking at Ready or Not, where young bride Grace couldn't be happier to marry the man of her dreams. But there's just one catch. She must play a deadly game of hide and seek with her new family due to their supposed pact with evil forces. This is kind of a tough one for me as I was hoping for the best from the movie, yet already had reservations after seeing the trailer because it seemed like it spoiled way too much and appeared to kind of lay out the whole movie in two minutes, leaving not much to be surprised by in the end. Although when the movie was first screening, it was met with nearly universal praise, heralding it as brimming with thrills, gore, surprising twists, and well-defined characters. After seeing these initial reactions, I thought to myself, oh cool, perhaps there is more than what was in the trailer, and the movie kept its best and most exciting moments a surprise. Maybe they were saving all the cool kills and twists for the movie. But the reality is that is not the case, as if you've seen the trailer, you've pretty much seen the entire movie in a condensed for. Of course, there are moments, including the ending, that aren't in the trailer. However, it really spoiled the entire experience for me because I already knew everything that would happen before it did in the movie. Maybe just a case of bad marketing, which has been the downfall of many films over time. Unfortunately, I found myself wanting more entirely across the board, and for the movie to push its concepts and ideas way further than they actually did. It felt like it was struggling with a tone throughout, dabbling in a few disparate ones, but ultimately failing to really explore anything with any substance. Like sure, there's the idea of rich people are bad, and they're willing to do anything to maintain their success, even making a deal with the devil. But that's about all the movie seems to say about it. It was also really difficult for me to not compare this to the already modern classic You're Next, as the setups are similar in many ways. Though Your Next did everything right, that I felt like this movie did wrong. And I don't know how people thought this was gory. Again, Your Next has way better and more intense gore, but it also does the story, characters, and twists on a much more successful level. A big stumbling point for me is the idea of a strong female protagonist. In Your Next, Erin had a survival background, and as soon as things turn sour, she springs into action to help save the family that she doesn't even know. For Grace and Ready or Not, unlike what I thought the movie would be, she does not actually get brutal, violent revenge on the family for involving her in their deadly game. And in fact, none of the characters appear to have a plan of any kind going on, which is also a pet peeve of mine. I like my characters to be proactive. And also, unlike your next, there's really only one potential victim in Grace, and you know she's not gonna get killed 45 minutes into the movie or anything. And this makes it really hard to feel suspense or tension throughout. We know there's not really any danger because these guys are all total morons. So what's there to be scared of? There was just a lot of, in my opinion, poor choices made in the script. The idea itself is good, it's the execution that's the issue. Just a huge missed opportunity on so many levels, more than I'm used to feeling after seeing a movie, because I can see where they could have gone and groan in despair when they go into some other ultimately pointless or uninteresting direction. It was just a funny experience going from low expectations after the trailer to suddenly high after the reviews, then to come crashing down again when I saw the movie myself. I also openly acknowledge that the movie has been getting pretty much unanimously good reviews. So maybe I'm the weirdo, just I didn't like it. I don't know. So that's fine. To, to each their own. So perhaps you've seen the movie and still have some questions about how things go down, or just want to know all about the twists and turns along the way. So we'll be breaking down everything you need to know, from all about the particular rules of the game, just who or what they've made their malevolent pact with, and explaining the ending that does have quite an explosive conclusion. For most, a wedding day is one of the happiest of their entire lives. And at first for Grace and her beau Alex, this does appear to be the case. The two genuinely in love despite their relatively whirlwind romance of 18 months. However, Grace is marrying into the extremely wealthy and powerful Le Dumas family who do things a little different than most. Though for her, getting married into the wealthy family is a dream come true, as she grew up in foster homes and was desperate to be part of a real family her whole life. But she's probably not going to want to be associated with these weirdos. And when we first meet the Le Dumas clan, we get some idea of the dynamics between them and their basic personas. Father Tony, head of the household and a very powerful and wealthy man, feels that Grace is below Alex's social status and inherently has a problem with her due to her poor upbringing. On the other hand, Mother Becky actually seems to like her based on their one interaction, but she's just here to play along with Tony and the family's wishes. We also have the wild-haired Aunt Helene, who does little more than grimace in disappointment around Grace, although she too had a personal encounter thanks to the family's long-held traditions. 30 years ago, her own 
new husband was forced to play a game. And ultimately, she had to help hunt him down and kill him, all in order to maintain the family's success. There's also Alex's brother Daniel, who seems to have some issues with their particular rituals and methods. Even his own wife Charity, who married into the family, seems way more committed to this whole thing than him. Along the way, Daniel always being considered the weaker brother. Thusly, he drowns his sorrows in booze, complaining sarcastically from the sidelines. For Alex, as mentioned, he was obviously disturbed enough to turn his back on his family for two years to get away from them, though ever since, his parents have longed to bring him back into the fold, intending for him to eventually take the family mantle and head honcho position in the future, which is of course of extreme importance to them. And it's thanks to getting married to Grace that he is obliged to return, as when it's time for marriage in this family, they have many important and unbreakable rules to follow. They are required to have the ceremony at their sprawling estate, and at the stroke of midnight, the newly joining member of the family must play a game. Alex didn't mention any of this prior, yet based on the half-truth that Grace is told, a simple game doesn't sound like too big of a deal, even if a little childish. And after the wedding ceremony and piles of carefully staged pictures, it's time for the real fun to begin. The family gathering in a special room marked with the family's surname that only those that are officially laid Amasas are allowed to enter. Here, Tony lays out the story behind their long-held traditions that began many years ago with their great-grandfather, Victor. He was a merchant sailor who spent much of his time traveling via boat and had a chance encounter on one trip, meeting a mysterious man named El Bale. Just like Victor, Bale too enjoyed games of chance, and the two played cards for hours, in the end, Victor winning their game. And Bale gifted him a peculiar black playing card box, and it's from this box that the new family member chooses a card, following whatever it says with no question. And by strictly enforcing this ritual, the family has grown more prosperous with each generation, achieving even greater heights under Tony's command, now owning several sports teams. The idea is that the newly joining family member is given a blank card and places it into the Bale box. When the card spits out, inscribed on it is whatever Bale has selected for them to play. Generally, it is a game with low stakes, nothing but harmless fun like Old Maid or Chess, which the other members that join the family Charity and Fitch played when marrying their respective significant others. But there's one game that has drastically different and much higher stakes than the others, Hide and Seek, which according to the family doesn't actually happen very often, Mother Becky only having seen one in her time with the family, along with Helene's ill-fated husband three decades prior. This is the only game that for whatever reason has more to it than your typical family fun night. If Hide and Seek is chosen, a weird old song is played via record, then the entire mansion is put on lockdown. The security cameras are shut off to stick with how the game was originally played in Victor's time, and the little boss family gather to arm themselves with various instruments of death, also sticking with the tradition of using objects from Victor's time, all in the name of sacrificing the newest addition to the clan. But first, they have to catch her. Grace isn't made aware of the murdery side of the game, only told her one chance of victory is to stay hidden until dawn. The truth being, according to legend, if they don't capture and sacrifice her by then, then the family will suffer a horrible fate for failing to follow El Bell's rules. And yes, it's heavily implied that Bale is indeed the devil himself. Victor made some kind of deal with him many years ago, and now everyone else has got to keep paying the price. Given 100 seconds to hide, naive to their ulterior intentions, Grace takes shelter in a dumbwaiter for a while before getting bored and wandering through the house. Though she soon discovers for herself what is really going on when hiding in a room a maid enters, and the coked up sister Emily mistakes her for Grace and accidentally kills her, quickly alerting Grace to the fact that this isn't your typical game of hide and seek. Even though according to the rules, Alex is required to not play the game and stay in a room under Charity's watchful eye, he easily escapes and takes Grace into another room to explain to her what's really going on. She's understandably pissed that he dragged her into this, but ultimately she gives in, believing that he is still on her side and will help her to survive the night. He intends to unlock the doors and windows so she can flee, but gets discovered by his father and brother who handcuff him to a bed, and it's up to Grace to turn the tables on the devilish family to save her hide. Yet, the family isn't exactly the most threatening around, and in fact, they aren't really much of a threat whatsoever, as the only ones they actually kill are Emily accidentally killing maids. That's it. So there's not really too much for Grace to be worried about. Oddly, rather than hunting them down for forcing her into their deadly game, she pretty much just runs away over and over again, only to usually get caught, escape, get caught, you get the picture. There's really not much meat to the story as a whole. It's just her going around the house, and the other people are somewhere else every time. They're just kind of farting around doing nothing until they find out they've lost her again. For me, that scene where she has the full game explained to her by Alex was a major turning point, and they should have done it differently that would have set up the movie I wanted to see. I don't know, maybe I'm just not a hopeless romantic or something, but if my fiance dropped a bombshell about his killer family, and he 
he actively put me in harm's way, I have to say that would be a deal breaker. Like you try to get me murdered, we're done here. What I would have preferred and how I feel I would have personally reacted in the situation is to immediately cut ties with him at this moment. Just being like, you are an ass for putting me in this situation. But guess what? I'm gonna hunt down every one of you fuckers one by one, leaving you until the end, buddy boy. How do you like that? This handily sets us up to have her hunting the family down and really getting satisfactory revenge. They're inherently bad people and due to their actions against Grace, deserve to be killed themselves. Also, this being the only way to make sure she makes it till the end. Instead, she just goes along with it. Oh, Alex, that was super rude of you to lie to someone you supposedly love, but I'm sure we can work it out. Hopefully your family doesn't murder me, but I'm glad you're still on my side. Yep. Yippee! Even though you got me in the situation in the first place. It's a stupid way to take the movie in my opinion, as it really feels like it was being sold as Grace getting revenge on the family. But this simply doesn't happen. Even that huge elephant shotgun she has on the poster doesn't even get used. She finds it and puts on the bandolier, and it feels like a big badass turning moment. Yet in her first encounter with the family butler, she learns the bullets are fake and it's never brought up again. Doesn't even get used once. It's just disappointing and kind of a bit of a misdirection marketing wise. Why else put her front and center on the poster with his big badass gun? Unless, you know, she actually uses it? I don't know, it's weird. So it's really just everyone running out the clock as Grace encounters various roadblocks to prevent her escape. And the family member is doing not much at all. Eventually she is captured by the butler guy. Yet Daniel, who has been struggling with the family's deranged rituals and how far they are willing to go, actually has a change of heart and poisons his family all of them horrifically coughing up blood and allowing Grace to escape again. Oddly, he's the only one to proactively really do anything plot-wise at all. Grace didn't do it, Alex didn't do it, only Daniel really makes an impact on things. Yet only a few minutes later, everyone that was poisoned is totally fine, which was kind of dumb too. Phew, I was coughing up blood a second ago, but I'm good now, let's get this bitch. Poor usurper Daniel winds up shot in the neck by his own wife, and Grace flees into yet another room, encountering a deranged Becky who attacks her. Grace getting the upper hand, when she stretches to grab an object to bash Becky's brains in. The L. Bale card box seems appropriate. Alex having literally sawed his way free through a bedpost, which would make you think he's indeed still on Grace's side, also randomly has a change of heart when seeing what Grace did to his mother, alerting the others to her location. And they round her up yet again, putting the ritual into action. Time is running out for the family as Dawn has nearly arrived. And Grace is strapped to a table in the family room, everyone donning ceremonial robes and passing around a goblet. Like I always say, gotta have a fancy ancient looking goblet if you're doing a satanic ritual, it's a must. And it's up to Alex to deliver the fatal blow to his new wife with a knife. And he does so, but only pierces her shoulder rather than her heart. So perhaps he was still having some lingering doubts about this whole thing, despite appearing to turn coat back to his family. Not killing Grace has broken the ritual. The family mortified as sunlight begins to peek through the windows. They miss their chance to complete the ritual in time. Yet everyone appears fine. And perhaps the ritual and reason for killing so many people was entirely unfounded. No, devil's pack to adhere to, but not so fast. Moments later, each of the family members explode instantly into a cloud of blood, one by one destroyed by the obviously now real family curse. Even those that married into the family aren't spared, as they were willing players in the game and being official family members after playing their own games previously, leaving in the end only Alex and Grace left. He thinks that perhaps he must be different enough from the others to survive, but nope, you're just as bad as everyone else. And he too explodes into a bloody gore cloud, covering Grace head to toe in the remains of her in-laws. And officially, she is the final survivor, and thus the winner of the game. For a moment, just as Tony said earlier, after everyone else is gone, Grace catches a quick glimpse of a figure sitting at the head of the table, Mr. L. Bale himself who was probably like, man, I love getting to explode people into blood blobs. And as mentioned earlier, clearly this man was in fact some kind of evil demon and potentially Satan himself. How else possibly could he blow people up like that for not following his ritual to a T? That's the thing, Satan is a stickler for details. After a fire was inadvertently started in the fracas earlier, the flames had begun to spread throughout the entire house. Grace taking a seat outside on the front steps and lighting a cigarette. An off-screen firefighter asked, what the heck happened here? And she coyly responded, in-laws as the movie ends. So with the entire family dead, thanks to what we now realize was a very real pact with the proverbial devil, only Grace is left. As far as where things go from here, it might be a little difficult for it to explain about everyone dying, although as their bodies more or less evaporated and the house is most likely going to burn to the ground, all evidence of supernatural weirdness would be wiped away in the flames. So would it be too difficult to consider her not being blamed for their mysterious deaths? Which also upon considering led me to think of one interesting caveat in the end. Grace 
Grace technically did marry Alex before all hell broke loose. And there was no mention of a prenup or anything, which means that in a legal sense, Grace is a Leda Moss. And since everyone else in the family is dead, she would stand to inherit their vast wealth and power, which is a fitting conclusion for Grace after everything she went through. Sure, in the end, she didn't get the family she wanted, but with money like she has now, you can easily buy love. All the love. Everyone knows that. And that about wraps it up for this ending explained for Ready or Not. Unfortunately, it just didn't meet the huge hype that I had going for it going into the movie. And I feel like a lot of people gave it way more credit than what I actually saw on screen. So if you're looking for a superior experience with a similar concept, make sure to check out your next. And while I do believe Samira Weaving did the best with what she was given and really gave it her all in the movie, if you want to see her really get to show off some of her particular talents, The Babysitter and Mayhem are also both way better options. Sorry guys, this one just didn't, didn't work for me. What did you guys think of Ready or Not and its ending? Am I the crazy one and the movie is somehow actually brilliant? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.